We have the honor of being joined today by Dr. Jennifer Gomez, who is a board member and chair of the Research Advisory Committee at the Center for Institutional Courage. She's an assistant professor at Boston University School of Social Work and Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health. Dr. Gomez wrote her first book on cultural betrayal, sexual abuse, and healing for Black women and girls. Her primary research focus is cultural betrayal trauma theory, which she created as a framework for empirically examining the mental, behavioral, cultural, and physical health impact of violence on black and other marginalized youth, young adults, and elders within the context of inequality. Dr. Gomez has published over 100 peer reviewed journal articles, book chapters, scholarly writings, professional documents, and pieces for the general public. Her work has been recognized by the National Academy of Sciences, the Ford Foundation, and Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging Research. Her ultimate goal for her research is to identify avenues of hope and healing for individuals, families, communities, institutions, and society. It is my pleasure to turn our grand rounds over to Dr. Gomez. Thank you so much. Um, and can people hear me? I don't know how to. Know, if you can hear me through the system. Let me, I'm, I have to have mine muted. So if you can run out, Stephen. Oh, good. I got it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I can be heard. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to um, just put this into slideshow. If you can help me, I just need to get this the PowerPoint into slideshow. Perfect. Awesome. So thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and special thank you to Chris for the invite, uh, Marge, who has helped so much um, in the prep for this. And then for Stephen, who deserves a raise and benefits for the last 45 minutes um, or 50 minutes working, to get the tech up and running. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm not sure where to look. We have some people here in front of me um, and then on the screen. So if I'm looking not at you, I apologize. Um, the title of my talk today is Cultural Betrayal, Sexual Abuse in Black Women, the Role of Institutional Courage, Mental Health, and Wellness. And so the question that we have for today is, for interpersonal traumas like rape, how can systems, how can structural change um, help benefit Black women's mental health and wellness? And so what I'll be doing is giving a little primer on sexual violence um, and anti-Black racism, so we're all on the same page. I'm then gonna talk about cultural betrayal trauma theory um, and give you the theory itself and then the study of the evidence so far. And then the buckle of the time will be spent in this institutional courage um, concept from Jennifer Fried, as well as really specific steps on what we can do systemically within our systems and within our hospitals um, to benefit um, Black women and their mental health. So for sexual violence, um, just to get us uh, grounded in the prevalence here, for Black American college women, um, very high rates here. And so I'll walk you through what these are. So any sexual abuse means uh, across the lifespan here, these are um, women average age of 20. Um, so you have uh, sexual abuse by grooming, by force, um, through incapacitation, uh, the whole gamut, uh, sexual harassment, um, trafficking, that's at 81% um, for these Black American college women in this sample. Any sexual harassment um, in the study, we operationalize that as verbal um, only. That's hovering also around 80%. Now, if we remove sexual harassment, think about all the other kinds of sexual abuse, molestation, rape, et cetera. Now it's looking like one in three uh, Black young women experiencing this. And then sex trafficking. So this includes someone forcing you to have sex with somebody else, um, that's over 10%. Um, even for a violence researcher, these rates are incredibly high. And this matters um, <laughs> for many reasons. Um, one, because we know that sexual violence is linked with a host of mental and behavioral health outcomes, things like symptoms of PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, and suicidality. Now for anti-Black racism, there's pulling from bugs and colleagues. So um, they say here, anti-Black racism is systemic in the US, so systems things, structural thing, um, a country whose founding and economic success was based on the institution of Black slavery. So what does that mean? It means that there was no equal opportunity for slavery, yes? It was an institution um, 
racist against black people. They go on to say developing a view of black people as less than human helped justify a system of slavery and the enormous profits made from it. So that means that you have this structural system of slavery that's racist. How can you justify something so abhorrent? You have to make it so um, that in your mind, black people are less than human um, and uh, subpar to you. Now, from a critical race perspective, racism doesn't go away, it shape shifts. And so what we see in the 13th Amendment is that, okay, we're done now with slavery on plantations. Um, ooh, but we're fine with it in prisons. Now, what do we do? Well, to make this work and not be abhorrent, you pair Black people um, with being criminals, thinking of Jennifer Eberhardt's work here. And when you do that, we become fine with criminals being enslaved. And then if those criminals are Black, we're extra fine. Now we have slavery in the prison industrial complex, um, including for-profit prisons, no longer on plantations, um, but in prisons. And you'll be shocked and amazed to know racism, also not great for your health, um, mentally or physically. And so here pulling from a special issue from a few years ago in social science and medicine, um, including um, the legendary James Jackson here, saying, what do we do then about racial inequalities in health? So the recognition numero uno, number one, is develop frameworks based on cultural and structural racism. What does that mean? Develop frameworks that say racism exists. And now if racism exists, where do we go? An example of this, um, could be with IQ testing. If racism exists and you see disparities, then you look at the racism within the test um, and how it was created and what its ultimate purpose was and is. So for uh, cultural betrayal trauma theory, it's a black feminist, critical race, scientific, empirically testable, so many things, theory that incorporates some of this context. And so I'm, uh, CBTT, cultural betrayal trauma theory, um, is newish, about 10 years, um, but the concepts are not. Some of the language is new. Um, so I'll point you to some foundational work um, that speaks of many of the same things I'll be talking about. Um, folks like Audre Lorde, um, the Pompeii River Collective, uh, Patricia Hill Collins, Bell Hooks, Tama Bryant, uh, Charles Mills, um, as well as uh, mainstream feminist work um, like that of Judy Herman um, and Jennifer Fried. Um, and so, I will skip this so that we still have time. I'll take you through the theory here. So if you're looking, let's use Black people um, in the US as an example. If you're looking up top at societal trauma, this is that racism thing that we talked about, the systemic racism. So because of that, some people develop what I term intracultural trust. So it's this love, loyalty, connection, responsibility, I am because we are, to buffer against that mean racism, right? That is so harmful. It's overall a positive thing. The problem happens when within group violence happens, so black perpetrator, black victim, then it breaks, it violates that intercultural trust. And so it's a cultural betrayal. And then this within group violence, winds from the black community as a cultural betrayal trauma, then what CBTT predicts abuse outcomes, things that we typically think about, um, like that slide I showed you of mental health outcomes, suicide, and so on as well as cultural outcomes, um, things that we typically don't associate uh, with violence, things like internalized prejudice. So if this is part, this violence, <laughs> if this is part of what it means um, to be Black, then I want no part of it. Um, and that seems like a pretty high cost, <laughs> yes, to violence. Um, so a quick note here on white supremacy and its role within the theoretical work um, and the times in which we live. So this perhaps fitting, um, I'm not staying in a hotel, uh, but I am from California. Um, with white supremacy, you can check out any time you like, uh, but you can never leave, yes, from the Eagles. And so this is the idea that if you're white and if you're like, but I don't see any racism, everything seems fine. You can feel that way if you like, but you can't get away from this. If you're black, if you're of color and you're like, look, my family has worked very hard. We have strived, that's why we're so successful. It's a nice try, racism is still affecting you and it's still affecting people with less privilege than you, um, people of lower class, et cetera. And so cultural betrayal trauma theory was created, is studied within this context. So what you see here is kind of like a bingo card um, for what white people will say to avoid real conversations about racism, <laughs> um, like slavery is over, um, I have a black friend, right, all the things. Another one is black on black crime. 
why are you whining that FBI statistics show that black pe- that police kill black people at three times the rate of white people? That's two black, dead black people a week. Why are you whining about it when there's black on black crime like Chicago, right? That would be a racist stance if we're not sure. You'll notice you never heard of white on white crime of Ted Bundy, um, for instance. Here's an excerpt from a talk I gave um, at Motor City Singer Space um, in Detroit, a speaker series, um, a musical series uh, to destigmatize uh, mental health um, in the black community. And I said, what we have happening um, is this block of protection um, for black people. If it's black, we can't question it. If it's black, we, um, we will stand by it, even if it's drowning us all, because we can't give them the system, the police, the judges, the teachers, the social workers, those well-meaning therapists, we can't give them another reason to denigrate us. And in that way, in privileging our fear of oppression, we privilege white supremacy. We behave as though their beliefs of us and their societal power over us dictates what is best for us. And we let them decide what we will and will not do to address a problem as big as sexual assault in the black community. So when we're thinking then about the harm, eventual need for, for systems change, right? Part of the harm of cultural betrayal is beyond our personal, right? Part of it is, is the racism that surrounds us. Part of it is, that, is the fear of what happens if you go and betray your race, um, is what people like to say. And so cultural betrayal trauma here is simply in a personal trauma, violence, um, abuse where the victim and perpetrator share at least one marginalized identity. Um, so within the black community, for instance. An example of this we may remember from 91, Anita Hill being sworn in to testify about to be confirmed Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's what I would call cultural betrayal, sexual harassment of her. We can also remember um, Clarence Thomas t- calling this um, a high tech lynching, um, which really um, inverts uh, who's the victim um, and who's the perpetrator here. So the state of the evidence, and I'm watching the time, I'll give you a little bit of flavor and I wanna really be able to, um, to dive into the institutional-ness um, of it all. Um, and so at this point, you might be thinking, I get it and I'm not racist, um, but isn't it possible that what you think is this cultural betrayal harm um, is actually something else? Um, and so if you research violence or trauma, you know, violence predicts bad stuff every day and twice on Sundays. Um, so potentially what I think is cultural betrayal is actually just an artifact of the harm of trauma. So what we've been able to do now in multiple studies um, with diverse marginalized uh, young adult populations is to control for trauma itself. Um, and then the cultural betrayal still predicts um, outcomes, mental health outcomes um, and cultural outcomes um, like internalized prejudice above and beyond the impact of between the trauma, the impact of the trauma itself this cultural betrayal thing happening. You may say, okay, but we also know um, that if you're gonna be abused, it's more likely to be by somebody who's, yes, within your ethnic group, but also someone that you know and trust. Um, and we know work from Jennifer Fried um, with betrayal trauma theory, that this high betrayal when the perpetrator is somebody trusted or depended upon, then that's toxic for outcomes. So maybe what you think is like cultural betrayal is actually this high interpersonal betrayal of the perpetrator and victim being close. We tested for that um, and have controlling for between group trauma, controlling for high betrayal trauma when the perpetrator is someone close. This cultural betrayal within group thing is still um, explaining variance and outcomes um, for mental health um, and cultural outcomes. And then you may be saying, okay, um, but I'm a social psychologist um, and isn't, couldn't this be maybe like an in-group thing? Like, I'm a rich white man, you're a rich white man. Like, I think we have something in common. So when you abuse me, it's harmful, not because of any oppression, just because we're part of the same group. Um, so we tested this um, and found that within group sexual violence is associated with this range of mental health outcomes um, from the trauma symptoms checklist for those familiar. So dissociation, anxiety, um, sexual abuse trauma index, like hypervigilance, sleep problems, uh, sexual problems. Um, but there's a moderator here, right? And the moderator's minority status. And so when it's within group and your minority, then it has increased link with these mental health outcomes. So evidence pointing so far across these diverse marginalized populations that 
yeah, could be like this cultural betrayal thing happening um, that's part of the harm. And that part of that harm then is necessarily stemming from this context of inequality because there is no need for intercultural trust in this manner against an inequality that does not exist. So there wouldn't be a cultural betrayal then without this inequality. Anybody look here? Yes, uh, the qualitative research that we have is from Robin Govan um, out of Urbana Champaign and myself. We asked uh, black young women survivors, um, average age about 20 again, who had experienced um, cultural betrayal, sexual trauma. So sexual abuse perpetrated by another black person. And we said, hey, um, here's cultural betrayal trauma theory. What do you think? Do you think it could be harmful? Not. Um, overwhelming majority said, yes, it's harmful. Um, yes, it's a kind of contextual and community oriented harm, right? Beyond the interpersonal. Um, yes, it's common. Yes, it's prevalent. Um, yes, there's within group variation um, here in that those who are multiple more marginalized within the black community are off worse, right? So if you're black and gay, for example, um, then it's worse off than if you're, if you're black um, and straight or at least presented straight. Um, so lots of evidence in this, um, in this direction. What I'm gonna give you now um, is a book preview and I have of course uh, changed the working title uh, since I submitted the abstract um, here. So I'm gonna give you a, a brief on what this is. Chapter six is the systems change. And then we're gonna dive into these institutional courage systems level change, um, probably why a lot of you are here. Um, so the book, uh, Cultural Betrayal, Sexual Trauma, a Black Feminist Approach to Individual, Interpersonal, and Structural Healing, um, essentially separate into two parts. Um, and so the first half is this basic research side. So chapter one on anti-Black racism and intersectional oppression. So this, that racism and sexism together um, impacts Black women. Um, not just uh, racism. Chapter two is about the contest of sexual abuse in the black community um, and the quote unquote rape problem um, being perceived as white women's uh, false accusations of rape um, against black men. Um, and that being the focal sexual abuse problem um, that's discussed and not uh, that some black men uh, rape black women and girls um, or that if you're a black woman and girl and you're raped, um, it's most likely to be by a black man or boy. Chapter three is about cultural betrayal, trauma theory, and the tenants, all of the evidence, um, et cetera. Now, second half is where it gets good. Um, it's all pentabulous, uh, but where it gets um, applied um, in a way, what we can, what can we do with this information. So chapter four on trauma-informed and culturally competent therapy. Um, this includes uh, uh, really thinking um, about the epistemology um, of mental health and how we understand mental health um, and then black feminist approaches um, to that. Um, and uh, equivalent approaches, including uh, relational cultural therapy, um, make it up, uh, Miller here, um, liberation health framework, um, my colleagues over at Boston University, um, Don Belkin, Martinez and others. Um, chapter five, since healing, thriving, health, wellness, wonderfulness um, should never be confined to a therapy room, right? Um, an entire chapter devoted on radical healing within the Black community. Um, and then chapter six is the chapter to make the entire book obsolete, if I could be so bold, which is how do we get to a place where we don't have the racism, the intersectional oppression of racism and sexism, um, at least, and others uh, together impacting folks? Um, how do we not have uh, the sexual violence business? Um, and so on. And so that's where I'm gonna dive in um, for the remainder um, of the talk. And I'm a boss with time, yes. Um, you all will miss nothing um, throughout this talk, even though we started late. So a prologue here for institutional courage. Um, I love this quote. It's, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows and not the flower. That means if a flower isn't thriving, doesn't bloom, you don't say you're a bad flower and you're a pathological flower, right? You say, okay, What's going on with the weather? What's happening with fertilizer? Is there soil? Like what's going on here? What are the reasons? What's the context, right? Around why this flower is not doing so well. And um, for any developmentalists in the house, this look familiar to you, Broth and Bunner's ecological systems model um, adapted uh, for cultural betrayal. The take home point um, here, I'm getting a little bit of noise. Someone might need to mute. Um, one of the Stevens <laughs> might need to mute. 
Um, here thinking about, again, it's not just this interpersonal stuff that we know is harmful. It's also this exosystem of police yeah, right. brutality, the judicial system and mass incarceration, the media um, and the negative portrayals, um, the macro system, dominant American culture, racism, sexism, classism, et cetera. And all of this is heaped on, yes, the person victimized um, and also the perpetrator and important, right? In thinking about potential bond, potential cultural trust, um, in victim and perpetrator. So the question for us that we started with was for interpersonal trends like rape, how can the structural change, um, systems level change, systems goodness, um, impact black women's mental health um, and wellness? So I'll uh, bring in, uh, invoke uh, James Baldwin um, into the room. This is from an interview he gave uh, in 1968 on the Dick Cavett show. Um, and he says here, I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only think okay. what they feel from the state of their institutions. So he goes on to say things yeah. like, I don't know if the Board of Education really yeah. hates black people, that doesn't matter, um, but I know that the schools that I have to go to um, and the books that are given to my kids, yes? Um, and so I love this quote because it gets us away from Chow Chow um, and from the, but I'm a good person, we all love the blacks, right? Um, we want them to feel comfortable here and gets into, okay, that's well and good, could be true, could be not true. Um, but what does your policies, your procedures, your climate, your culture, what does that show? And that will tell us um, what you actually care about. So here from Jennifer Fried, uh, founder of Center for Institutional Courage um, and creator of the concept um, of institutional courage. Um, so the definition here, she says, is institution's commitment to seek the truth um, and, and engage despite unpleasantness um, and short-term cost. It's a pledge to uh, protect those who depend on the institution. It's a compass oriented to the common good of individuals, institutions, and the world. And it's a force that transforms institutions into more accountable, equitable, and effective places for everyone. Well, that's just lovely. Um, what does that mean <laughs> tangibly? So this from an article, um, from a few years ago regarding the American Psychological Association and psychologists' role in torture um, against um, human beings on Guantanamo Bay. What we did in this paper, we did many things, um, but one of them uh, was we put together a, a chart, a list um, of what could uh, Little APA, what could American Psychological Association do um, to change course to correct um, what's gone wrong here. So what I've done for us um, in the book and today um, is I've adapted um, this table uh, for black women and girls um, who have experienced culture betrayal, sexual trauma, and what would institutional courage look like? Excuse me for them. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now, excuse me, is three different classes of institutional courage. So the first two are kind of base level, what you can be doing. So operations, how we go about our, our daily business, and assessments, how do we know actually how things are going on here? And the third is reparations. What do we do when stuff's gone wrong, right? And we know it. So class one operations. You have this up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'll orient you to the table and then I'll pick out a few to highlight. So on your left-hand column, you have the institutional courage step itself, like operate with transparency. Um, in the middle column, you have an example of what that could look like. Um, so in this case, uh, example would be disseminating honest and complete information about structural racism, intersectional oppression as racism, sexism, business, um, sexual violence against black women and girls um, to members of the clinic, um, so clinicians to clients. Um, and the third column on the right-hand side is the verifiable outcome. How would you know if you did it? Um, so beyond like the wishes and hopes and dreams that we're doing something right, how could you actually tell? Well, you would have the number of accessible articles and presentations and books um, that could be read and understand um, by folks um, is how, how you can know. Another one down here um, is uh, complying with laws. Um, shouldn't need to be stated, <laughs> um, but it is importantly with also the spirit of the laws. And so if it would be, um, illegal, say against uh, Title IX, um, to sexually harass uh, women in the workplace. Um, if you slide in under the radar and say, 
I'm not federally sexually harassing you. I'm just creating a super hostile work environment in which you're constantly sexualized. Yeah, maybe you didn't break the law, um, but you're not complying with the spirit of the law, which is to have this place be free of discrimination, right? Including sexual harassment. Also known as like, so don't be rapey <laughs> tenant here, right? Another one, educate individuals. Um, I'll point us to this last one here um, on the slide, incorporating social justice. And so an example of not doing this would be at a university, uh, let's say we have um, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, committee is formed to bring in speakers, and wouldn't you know it, the whole committee are white women, um, all the speakers are white women, um, and a black woman comes over and says, hey, I'm wondering if we can like talk about uh, racism, talk about homophobia, um, their intersection, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the response is, we're like really strapped. Um, and so like, we'll, we're gonna do it this way now, but I promise in a few years, we'll add in like the racism stuff to this. We wanna get like it settled within, within campus. Yes, that would be not incorporating social justice, right? Um, and so anytime you have to say like, we'll do it the wrong and equitable way for like right now, but, like I promise in the future, we won't, like that can't be where we're trying to go. Right. So incorporating at every corner that you can these aspects of, of social justice um, and then correcting yourself when you still mess up and keep doing it and better, better again and again. The last one I'll point to here for um, operations is heaven help us all commit resources um, to every step that we're going to talk about today. Um, what this again does not mean is you have, uh, let's say, all the clinicians. Um, in a clinic working uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Um, and then you say, but also on your load is to be like culturally competent and make sure you're doing um, education and do this and this, and it's each of our jobs to do it. Who's gonna do that when we don't actually have the time? What if you have at a university, a Title IX coordinator um, whose job is to deal with all things sexual violence, um, sexual misconduct, as well as like plagiarism, um, as well as events and advocacy on campus, like that would be not committing resources, right? And resources are budget, so the actual money, which would be time, like time allocated in your schedule, and then at the actual person power, um, multiple people on this. Phew. So that is your operations, how we can basically move here. This next step and what you're gonna see in these slides um, are a whole host of like different kinds of self-assessments. Um, and you can pull their sexual violence researchers, there are social scientists, right, of all kinds um, with expertise in scale development. So there's a way to do this that's scientifically sound, um, that has the latest and greatest um, techniques for this work, um, including one like, uh, don't ask people if they've been uh, raped, for instance. They'll tell you no, because rape is such a loaded term that a lot of people do not want to associate themselves or their experience with. And if we're thinking from a cultural betrayal perspective, we might not want to associate this person with that term either. And so instead of what you do is you ask behaviorally, did somebody ever um, have sex with you while you were passed out, intoxicated? Um, did someone ever touch you when you didn't want? Um, and then you get truer rates um, of what's going on. The social scientists can help with this, yes? Um, we know a fair about. Why um, are conducting self-assessments courageous, right? Like it seems like just, you know, put it and make it a resource and then do it once a year, once every two years, whatever it is. The reason is that when you get the information back <laughs> and it looks like not as great <laughs> as you thought it was gonna look, you're then faced with that. And you actually have to do something about that. It becomes much harder to not do something about that when the script you were telling yourself was like, look, you know, in this department, we've got idiot person who wreaks havoc, but the problem is this person. Um, the problem isn't cultural, it's not for all of us. Then you get these findings back and you're like, ooh, it's like all of us. Um, actually, including myself um, as a practitioner here, including myself as a leader here. Um, and now I have to do something um, with this information. Here's why it's important. Um, well, I mean, hopefully obvious, we don't want to be rife with like awfulness in our workplaces. Um, 
But also, if you don't know, you can't fix it, right? And additionally to that, if you want to be implementing strategies, like you want to be implementing like trainings or interventions or whatever, how do you know if they work or not? If you don't have a baseline of where you start, right? Um, and a long-term longitudinal perspective is really important here because what can happen is that you do baseline assessment, people say X, Y, or Z is happening. You give education, you do it again, and people say, whoa, way more stuff is happening. And then you're like, oh my gosh, iogenic effects, like we ruined everybody. What could have happened is that people were more aware of what was going on and felt more comfortable to share with you what was going on. Or it could be that stuff got worse for whatever internal external reason. So you have to be looking longitudinally across time, not just two time words, but across time to know, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? What's helping? What's not helping? The last one here, so this is um, the what do we do when, when stuff's gone down, right? And there's some big kerfuffle, something's happened, and now we're supposed to do something about it. One um, is bear witness to victims' harms. A lot of times what can happen, you see this like interface, right, with racism, intersectional oppression, prejudice, that the uh, person I'm pulling here from um, Sara Ahmed, um, when you identify a problem, you become the problem, right? So like, if I say like, actually eek, there's like a, our black clients um, in this clinic are being like treated systematically worse than the white clients. They're on the wait list for longer. They're dropping out more often. Um, they're reporting less satisfaction um, with therapy. Um, and now I'm the bad clinician who's betraying the clinic, right? And so having a sense that you're uh, bearing witness to victims' harms um, is really helpful. And we'll go to another point I have on a future slide about cherishing the whistleblower. Say thank you when people tell you things. Yes, this is hard to do when we're trying our best and we feel defensive. So you can feel defensive on your own, on your own time, and then be grateful that somebody is letting you know what's going on here. So then you have an opportunity in your role and in your collective role to fix it. A really important one, and this uh, point from a a student of mine, um, Lama Hassan Ayub, um, and from Patricia Collins' work with Standpoint Theory. Understand the problem. Um, what do I mean? So let's say that we have a black woman client or patient, white woman um, clinician. Black woman says, hey, I don't like how this clinician is talking to me. They're condescending to me. They're not believing me when I tell them about this harm. They get into my personal space, like touching my hair um, without my consent. And then white woman clinician says, oh, this client is just so mean to me because I come in every time and I try my best and I don't think it's fair. And then client or patient gets labeled as a troublemaker that no one wants to work with. And then everyone rallies around white woman who's now crying, right? Literally or figuratively. If instead you understand the problem from the person being marginalized, from the person being oppressed, you say, black woman patient or client, what do you think is going on here? What's your definition of the problem here? Well, I think that, um, I think she's trying, I think she might be very nice, um, but it's discriminatory how she's treating me um, in this, 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 this way. Then you can work together to co-create public statements, co-create educational materials that use that definition, that understanding of the pain um, to then make change. When we don't do that, let me put it this way, it is hard to do that when racism interrupts us from doing that. So who has the objective view? The white people, who has the objective view? The professionals, right? Not the person who's racialized, who's black, not the person who's coming in with mental health struggles. Right. So we have to, again, again, it's like from the other uh, operations, uh, institutional courage, like incorporating social justice into each piece, including how do I hear concerns from somebody who's marginalized? And what is my role, e.g. to listen, um, to learn, um, when this person comes and tells us things? Right. I feel like this one is a huge trip up. <laughs> Whenever I think, like, why is this so hard? We have steps of what to do. Sociology's got great structural stuff, right? Industrial, organizational, IO psychology has great stuff. Why is this tough? This one is that we keep, we reify the racial hierarchy, we reify the oppression in our efforts to address the problems. Acknowledge wrongdoing, um, say you're sorry, 
um, for interpersonally in our personal lives and workplace, I'm shocked and amazed at how hard it is for many people to just apologize and just say you're sorry. Um, and I think part of this, particularly those who are um, professionals who have been educated in white supremacist systems who are taught that you are competent, you are the leader, you are correct, and you don't show weakness, right? Because then they'll take advantage of you. Um, it's a fairly toxic <laughs> leadership, right? Um, what about like, I am I have this expertise um, that I went to school for, that I have experience in, et cetera. My client has expertise in their own life, um, in their health, and together we work um, to figure out what we can do. That means that they can mess up. That means, oopsie, I can mess up a lot actually also. And it's much harder for me to see that when I'm with a client who has brought their baggage in the middle of the room and mine is just like hidden under my seat, right? Like it's still there. We just pretend that it's not. Apologize, last one here, um, correct or redact fault statements. I think I'm about two minutes out, um, heads up. Um, and this one's I mentioned, cherish the whistleblower. Um, say thank you and here highlighting uh, Drew Dixon, uh, Sherry Sher and others who spoke out on, on the record documentary about uh, Russell Simmons' um, sexual abuse against them. So the question um, that we started with for interpersonal traumas like rape, how can this structural change, how can our roles as institutional actors, right, as clinicians, as doctors, um, as educators, et cetera, um, impact Black women's mental health and wellness. So the thing to remember here, and for the book, Wish Me Luck, I'm working on creating a figure to show how these things are related in a beautiful fashion. So wish me creativity um, and depth here. The idea is that these interpersonal traumas are more than interpersonal. Why? Because of this structural racism business, because of this racism and sexism business together, because of the cultural betrayal that only exists because of the inequality, um, because of the violence, intercultural pressure that I didn't discuss today is a, it's like this violent silencing that keep problems in house. Don't make us all look bad, Black people, by saying what R. Kelly is finally being convicted of doing um, over decades. Um, that intercultural pressure, that violent silencing, that keep problems in house exists, why? Ultimately because of the racism, right? And so if then, the violence is more than just interpersonal. And if then the reason that's harmful is because of these systemic factors, then it follows that we need systems level change, right? And how can we do that through this institutional courage? Um, and then that causally impacts black women's uh, mental health and wellness. Oof. Okay, we have about six minutes. Um, I think I deserve a cookie. Um, for getting through this, resources if you want to learn more, I'm Jennifer M. Gomez, so my website is jmgomez.org. Um, I have a bunch of stuff up there, including the Cultural Betrayal Trauma Theory tab, um, which has uh, videos, terminology, graphs, and figures, and definitions, and all this kind of stuff, and all the links to the articles, um, etc. Additionally, um, on Open Science Framework, I have uh, two series, so Hope Lab Professional Development Series, um, in the Gomez Social Justice Institutional Change Collection. Um, these are different documents for how to go about making systemic change um, in lots of cases that I've created and then compiled um, in these two cases. Now I am so ready um, for your reflections, questions, discussion, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for a really wonderful and moving presentation. Uh, ask people if they do have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll get through as many of them as we can. But I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, you spoke a lot about institutional courage, institutions doing self-assessments um, and making changes. And this is something I think that we at McLean Hospital are really passionate about doing um, and are dedicated to doing. And in many ways, I think that you know, we as an institution have our own work to do in terms of our employees and making them feel valued and increasing the diversity of our workforce. But in particular, your presentation is so relevant to serving the mental health needs of black women. And, um, and I'm wondering, can you, can you give us an example 
of maybe a model institution that was able to do some kind of a self-assessment in this way and make even one concrete change that that could be measured, that could be that that people from the outside could look at, or people from the inside could look at and say, this really made a difference. This was so worth our time and investment. It improved something. It improved our employees. It improved the mental health of Black women. It increased access to mental health services for Black women, something. It's just something that we can wrap our minds around and that we might even consider doing ourselves. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I'm hearing Chris through the computer and in the room. <laughs> um, so I did my right. best to, to understand um, um, the question and be able to respond to it. So a couple things. The uh, first I'll start is that institutions are very complicated. Um, and so it becomes difficult to say X institutions doing well because there are so many different facets where like this corner is doing awesome, that corner is like still a hot mess. Um, and it becomes difficult to kind of like hang your hat onto an institution where a specific one to name where there could be other stuff going on that you don't know about. Um, I think, I think uh, what's coming to my mind um, clinically are all bad examples. Like it's, they're all examples of like how this has not worked or how to know that stuff is not working, um, which is not what you asked me. I'm thinking about easy things of like recruitment and retention. Um, we have a revolving door of clinicians of color um, who, who never stay um, would be one way to know. An example I have um, that is not clinically related, um, but related to this field um, is my own uh, school of social work. Um, so summer, 2020 happened and everybody said, oh my gosh, there's racism and we had no idea. Um, we wanna change things. And many universities said, we wanna hire more um, faculty of color. Um, many institutions uh, did not do that. Um, the BU school um, has. So I was hired in this way. We had three incoming faculty of color. We're doing a search now. Um, came from a job talk this morning that looked awesome. And of course with other applicants um, coming in. Um, the change that we saw compared with a different institution that I know of um, who said the same things and magically hired um, a mediocre white man um, to come in for the position um, despite something different. Why does this benefit, I think, Chris, of, of getting to your question here specifically, for the School of Social Work for Psychology for Psychiatry, I'm about this a little bit in, in my book in the conclusion chapter of if you're thinking of where to start in terms of treating black women um, clients well, maybe make sure you're treating black women graduate students well um, and medical students and, and, um, and people who are in, in the roster in the come up. Um, how would you know that you did that? Um, is if you could recruit more if people stayed, um, if they went off and didn't leave the field after they got their degree because they couldn't stand it um, and so on. Those aren't good answers, um, Chris, partially because many places do this awfully um, and partially because of my nervousness of hanging my hand on any one place that could be doing something wonderful and something terrible um, at the same time. I will say this, um, and I might be right at time when I say this, so I apologize for the other questions that are coming in. The Center for Institutional Courage, um, founded by Jennifer Fry, and who's I'm, I'm a board member um, for full disclosure, has a grants program. Um, small grants program, five, ten, fifteen thousand um, dollars, where you can do this kind of institutional work, um, institutional courage work that's very difficult to fund um, in, from other places um, and other kind of the typical places we go to for funding. And so that could be a way to try to get at the actual measurement and documentation of this. So sorry, that's fine. I think that's I think that's really helpful. And you know, sadly, I think it's also helpful to hear you say that you have seen it done poorly a lot of places. And I, I feel the same way. And that's why I asked the question that I asked because I, I want to look for models of success and models of doing it well. And so I think, I think we all recognize we have our work cut out for us. I just want to 
take note of all of the comments, people hooraying you and thanking you profusely for um, all of your work and for sharing your expertise with us today. I'm mindful of the time, so we are gonna go ahead and conclude, but I wanna, um, again, a warm thank you to Dr. Gomez. Thank you all. Thank you.